Welcome back to another great episode of the Crossboard Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, as always, Chris Brown. And today we are going to be shining another community spotlight on one of the great organizations here in the city of Calgary. And today's organization that we're shining a spotlight on is the Cornerstone Youth Center. And to join us in this journey of discovering who the Cornerstone Youth Center is, we are pleased and proud to welcome back a guest that we had on in December, if I'm not mistaken. And if I can do my math correctly and I can remember far back like that after a surgery, um, Larry Leach, the chair of the Cornerstone Youth Center. Larry, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Always happy to uh, to talk about Cornerstone and yeah, proud board chair and happy to uh, to share what we do. So, Larry, I got to start off with the very first question because I, I, I relatively try to do a little bit of research, but anyone who's listened to the show knows I don't come in with a lot of notes because I want to learn like my guests or my listeners will be learning. So what is the Cornerstone Youth Center? The the uh, the Coles notes on it is a, it's a great little spot. It's a, it's a house, uh, former house, I guess, with, with renovations and such. It doesn't very much look like a house anymore, but uh, it's it's a house on a corner near a junior high school, and so it's a after school uh, program. So we don't do any weekend programs um, for kids to come, and um, and it's junior high aged youth. Uh, and th- there's several programs that we do, but the the the, uh, the fundamental thing that we do is a thing called 40 developmental assets. And uh, your listeners may want to dig into that a little bit more. There is a website uh, on 40 developmental assets, which is a uh, done by the Research Institute, and it's a very very um, very old program. So it's got some real bones to it around psychology. And basically, there's 40 developmental assets that every person needs to to be a successful in whatever they they want to be successful in. And so we go through and do surveys, uh, quarterly surveys with the youth that come through the center, and then that develops our programs. So somebody going in this year would have a whole different set of programs than somebody that came five years ago or five years from now, based on the youth that we have coming in because it's it's trying to fill the buckets um, and so wherever there's assets that are missing or lacking or, or needed uh, that's where the programs get catered to so I, I think I gotta uh, go back to the beginning because I, I did like I said I've done a little bit of research and I just want to learn a little bit more but the Cornerstone Youth Center started in 1994 correct yes yeah. and there were fits and starts so it opened it closed and you know due to lack of funding and then it reopened again and then so the um there were there were years there where it wasn't open but it's been open consistently since about 2004 now what was the need for the actual cornerstone youth center because you talked about a place for kids but what was the initial need do you remember i'm not sure if you were there in 1994 when it originally opened but what was the pressing issue that started or re-brought it back in 2004 when it officially to where we are today. I don't think there was a particular catalyst. Basically how it started is it started as part of a church and a church um, where I'm, I, is in the same parking lot as the house. They own the house. So they they give us the center for a dollar a year and we're about 15 years in arrears. Um, and I always like to say that because it's true. And it, so it's not about them getting rent. It's not about them. It's, it's about them using that building for a service and they decided early on that it was going to be a youth center and then over the years um, they decided that uh, there should be separation that it should be its own organization because it was only attracting you know uh, people that maybe um, churchgoers kids or what have you and so now it's a completely not it always was a non-denominational but when a church runs it there's a certain um, perception and so now it's its own organization and we get we get kids of all shapes sizes colors uh, we have when we were getting all those Syrian refugees, they were they were coming right out of the gate, and so there was some interesting uh, interesting uh, differences in their behaviors that were that, that uh, the staff had to deal with and such. Now. You talk about the different ages and groups and colors and sizes of kids who come through the organization, but is there a requirement? Like, can you, is it just for kids of certain ages or is it for economic status? What, uh, who, who can use the youth center at the end of the day? Or is it literally, like you said, for everyone who wants to come in and drop in and use this organization? The, the only requirement is grade six through nine. 
That's it. That's it. And it, but what's amazing, Chris, is I've seen it over the years. Um, the kids that need it end up there and the kids that don't need it don't. For example, my son, when he was in junior high, he went a number of times and he knew half the kids there. He knew the executive director. And of course he knew the board chair. Um, and he was just kind of like, no, I'm good. Right. Whereas the kids that really need it were going every day. So um, obviously he had those gaps filled at home. Right. So, uh, yeah, we end up getting those kids just based on the fact that these are the programs that we offer. And this is the programs that we run and the, the kids that don't seem to need it or kids that get that piece of their bucket filled will move on. They'll. It's, so it's a natural kind of progression more than it is that you have to meet this certain socioeconomic status. Um, kids that don't have anywhere better to go, right, are, are, are going to. And is it for, uh, how, do I, how do I say this? Do you have to pre-register? Because uh, I know drop-in centers uh, in previous iterations of my life, back in Lloydminster, back in Ontario, you could literally just walk in and use the organization. Uh, is that similar to what Cornerstone does? So this is a complex answer. <laughs> <laughs> I love complex answers. Before COVID, yes. Um, there was a registration form, and then you just dropped in when you dropped in. But you had to have the consent of a parent or or your uh, guardian, guardian, whoever, whoever it may be, um, to sign on to let you come. So they'll, they'll let you come in the first time. Here, bring this form back the next time. Um, now it's a little bit more stringent because there's all kinds of restrictions as to how many kids we can have and so on and so forth. So the red, you you actually have to register for the time, the day, etc. Um, just because of restrictions, the door is locked. So it's it, because of all the COVID restrictions, we can't sort of offer that drop in type service. But when all those things lift, I think we'll we'll go back to the to somewhere closer to what it was before. Now, yes, you definitely have to register. You opened up a sort of a can of worms there because COVID-19 has reared its ugly head since 2019. And we are recording this in. Well, let's let's be honest. 2022. How has your organization changed due to the pandemic? And have you been able to adapt to the ever changing restrictions, lockdowns, restrictions, lockdown, new requirements from the government? And has that put pressure on your organization and caused you to take funding where you would potentially use it towards the kids and move it towards potentially updating uh, COVID standards that we currently have in place? Yeah, again, a complex answer. Thank you. Uh, but <laughs> that, but that, that's the great thing about this show, right? There's lots of space for the guests to talk. Uh, so, so we'll start with the beginning. I guess at the beginning of the pandemic, of course, we had to shut. So we basically have followed the same as the schools. If the schools shut, we're shut. That, that's how we've sort of um, set up our, our protocols. Um, originally, there was a lot of funding out of the gate from... Uh, from places like the uh, United Way, um, Calgary Foundation, etc., for the COVID uh, pivot for organizations. And so we took advantage of a lot of that opportunity to use that funding to go online. So we had an online um, uh, youth center every day. Um, when we look back on it now, um, it, yeah, it was all we could do, but it wasn't as effective as as being in person or effective as we would have liked it so now that we're able to get kids back even though it's a a smaller cohort um, we're able to dig deeper because it's a smaller cohort and do more things for less youth but those youth that have been through isolation been through lack of sports lack of socialization lack of self-esteem they don't have the sports or whatever organization whether it's arts theater all those types of things that age group is particularly um affected by that because those are things that that fill your bucket and and you know move you on to high school where you decide okay this is what i'm going to be so those those couple years those kids have missed have been enormous and so we really try to dig deep down into those things and what they're missing and try and try and fill those buckets before they go off to high school so it's really more of a uh, impactful um, for less amount of youth 
Now, what are some of those buckets that youth are uh, missing right now? Because you, you've talked about programming, and I've looked on the website, and it shows uh, some of the, off the programs that you have offered and do offer. But in this time of COVID-19 and your organization sort of being that catch all of any kid who's going through a system that might not be able to get that full lifestyle of being at school, how does your organization come in and help those youth and sort of to that 40 development asset uh, area that we were talking about at the beginning, how does your organization help those kids on a one-on-one -on -one basis? Or is it more of a area where kids can just come and socialize and the programs that you offer give them sort of the life uh, skills and the lifestyle that they might not get at home and they might not get at school because of this whole COVID-19 world? Yes, uh, all, like really all of that, uh, you know, like anything, a good personal relationship can open up many doors. And so that's where the, the basis is formed. So our staff will make sure they have good relationships. And because they have good relationships with fewer kids, they can actually dig deeper. A good example of sort of the uh the programming that may not look like it's scientific if if a uh, if a youth is sitting playing with cards or playing crib with one of our staff the staff knows that kids 40 developmental assets and what they're missing and so they can be playing cards they can be being, playing crib and having a conversation about hey i i how, how are we doing with making friends that was an area that that you 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 were working on have you made some and then it's maybe hey um jimmy or sally come on over and meet joey right and so whatever that asset is that they're missing the staff know in their in their heads because they've studied the the students uh, results and so the program isn't necessarily to get them to make friends it's a crib game and then hey intentional behaviors that that will help those kids so it's really about uh, at this point is having that bigger impact on each individual kid you, I want to dive a little bit deeper into the 40 development asset here because uh, for those who are listening might not know and like myself I, I relatively don't know what 40 development asset can you explain to me like I'm a two year old mm -hmm. how that how 40 development asset is a asset mm -hmm. <laughs> to teach our children and even in day-to-day -day lives like us today because I, I, I from my perspective uh, I can tell you that I've always had a hard time making friends and yes I picked up crib I picked up bridge because it was able to make get give me that connection with people that I was not getting by just randomly walking up to them in a bar saying hi would you like to be my friend because that can sometimes be a little bit creepy right yeah <laughs> well we develop those skills right and in junior high age and into high schools when we start developing those skills understanding who we are how so in junior high you might remember your junior high uh, years you probably remember it better than me because you're probably a little closer to it but um, the, 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 the you don't know who you are in junior high and so we're, we're getting kids that are still trying to figure out who they are and they don't know that much more in high school but they have a better idea of who they are in high school so that's why the junior high age is important and that's and that's where um, police Police will tell you um, that that's where the the gang recruitment starts. That those are the age groups where um, crime is something that could be um, a, an easy way for a a young um, junior high age youth to make money, and they don't quite have that. I don't know who I am, and and I don't have those quite have those filters yet and so that's why this is a really big thing when i talk about crime prevention with my with my day job is it that fits like a glove true crime prevention is to make sure those kids don't end up going the wrong way and so um so all of those things that we develop in those years um, uh, you know how to make friends good family structure um trusted adults so questions like do you have a trusted adult that you would tell anything to um, do you have a, a good friend that you could talk to uh, do you know your neighbors all of those types of things those are all things that make you safer make you feel safer in your community and also give you the confidence to be able to 
to move forward. And now with lack of school, lack of socialization, lack of ability for schools to fill those buckets, uh, it, it becomes a little bit harder. And so we got to make sure that we, we, we get to those kids that really need us. We have moved into more of a virtual learning system in the, in this day of age. Um, have you seen kids suffer because of that change from in person like we are right now, which anyone who's watching this, I want to be sure that I scanned Larry's uh, QR code before he came in here. We are socially distanced and we're making sure everything's above board here. Um, I, I want to know as the chair, are you seeing youth fall through the cracks? Because you you look at the stats that are coming out from organizations around the world, youth are suffering because of this lockdown, lockdown, or not lockdown. So from your perspective, how are youth coping with this change of world? And how have you guys been able to come in and sort of pick up the pieces and say, okay, while we are in this new digital world, we can still connect and we can still be that bridge and we can still play that virtual card game because now everything's online and you can still make friends even though it's harder because let's be honest and I'm not saying you should go out and try to make friends on the internet because let's be honest that can probably backfire on you. How have you been able to help kids in a digital world when we're all learning at the same time here of what a new digital world looks like. Well, and there, that's the rub, right? I mean, the, the thing that I've noted about kids is they've always been way more resilient than adults. Adults have a bar in their head of <laughs> what they expect. Kids don't have that bar. And so, oh, I don't have to go to school today. Oh, I got to learn online. Oh, right. So outwardly, they seem to be doing fine, but it's the, those pieces that we talked about on the, on the 40 developmental assets yeah. list that they're missing. And so that's what we, that our, our staff has noticed is that those there, there's a whole lot of gaps there. Um, and I think that age in particular, I think once we, once we're five, 10 years out of this pandemic and studies are done on the times, uh, I think you're going to find that junior ha uh, high aged youth are, are going to be the ones with the more issues because those are the, those, those are the years that you're developing those things that you can't develop now because you're not able to, to go to in-person school. The good news though Chris is I think that we all as a society are recognizing that online relationships aren't enough for us yes we're all you know everybody wanted to drive to online prior to the pandemic and put everything online and hell I'm on there all the time myself so love it but we also have to recognize that we need to get out and meet with people and be in person. And the lack of it has actually taught our society a lot. And I think those youth that are going through it now maybe end up better adults because they know what they're missing and they make sure that they have that in their lives. Um, but that's something for, for down the road. Um, and, and I also, one of the things I've talked about just from a personal standpoint is I'm really interested to see the rosters of professional sports down the road because those key developmental years in sports have been lost and that junior high high school age is where that decision is made I'm going to be a professional soccer player I'm going to be a professional football player and a professional hockey player and I, it'll be interesting to see the birth dates on the rosters and to maybe see a pretty huge gap and so you got a lot of veterans and a lot of young people but n not as many in the middle type of thing so that'll be an interesting study that I hope to read one day you've just crushed my hopes of ever becoming an NHL <laughs> player ever in my life but I'll tell you we could be curlers we could go to the Olympics and be curlers. Um, you made you made mention of the uh, staff. I want to talk about the organization now. We talked about what you do, but let's talk about the organization. Who 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 are they? 
who who are the great staff? Are they professional support workers? Are they volunteers? Who make up Cornerstone Youth Center? So we've got our wonderful board of directors. Hi guys, <laughs> I'm going to send you a link when it's live. Um, and we we do governance, so we're the overarching. Um, before the pandemic, I used to drop by quite a bit because the center happens to be two blocks from my house. So literally, I'd be going to groceries and I'd say, hey, how you doing? And I'd just kind of see what was going on. And it was always great to, to catch the energy of the kids and stuff. Since COVID, I've been in the center. I've never been in the center when kids are there. Um, again, out of respect for staff and everybody. Um, so I miss that a lot. But um, so we have the board. We've been meeting virtually. We haven't even met in person at the center yet. Um, then we have our executive director, Bob McInnes, uh, as I like to call him, the great Bob McInnes. Uh, he, uh, he runs the show in terms of uh, helping us get uh, funding, donors, um, uh, great uh, support from the community, uh, as well as uh, managing the staff. Uh, we have a, an office coordinator who does all the, the, the bookkeeping and organizing of, uh, of um, so these are the paid, staff these are paid positions. Yes, and 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 then we have uh, we have a couple of support workers and a manager of them. So, but then there's also practicum students we bring in. Uh, so the the main core of our staff are trained in child studies. So there's uh, child studies uh, that uh, Mount Royal and U of C have in their uh, in their programming. So four year program. Etc., and they learn all kinds of great things that uh, you know help youth to to become their best. And then uh, we do have volunteers as well, but less, of course, during COVID, just because the ratios and so on and so forth. But we do have we do have some practicum students that come in as well and and help out. So it's a it's a blend of all of that. You talked about donors and fundraising because in in today's age, COVID-19 has a lot of people are penny pinching right now because inflation is going through the roof, uh, all that fun stuff. Well, by that, I'm if I, for anyone who's about to send me messages about inflation, about saying I, I just said uh, fun stuff, I will file it away in the appropriate location if you do send it. I did not mean it. It was a quick joke. Um, I, I just I, I get weird messages from time to time. Um, I want to ask, how has the financial crunch that we are seeing globally and even here in Calgary, well, globally means Calgary as well, but how has that changed how you guys are working it's it's been dramatic um but i wouldn't say i I wouldn't say there's a lack of funds um i think people are just being a lot more careful um where they where they put their funding um but um it's been okay uh, I wouldn't say we're we're uh, you know filling buckets of cash or, or any of that. That would uh, be silly. But we operate on a on a two hundred fifty thousand dollar budget a year. Um, operate the whole center, um, so it's 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 not a bad bang for your buck. And and that's kind of the pitch we make is that we're we're really impacting youth lives that need it. Um, and for two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, we're we're able to do that. How can people get involved? How can people reach out? How can people donate? Uh, I'm not sure if you're still asking for volunteers due to this COVID pandemic because with all the restrictions that are in place, but how can people make a difference and get involved in the Cornerstone Youth Center if they want to? The best place is to email our fabulous executive director, Bob McInnes, and he's bob at cyccalgary.com. So I'll say that again, Bob at cyccalgary.com. And, uh, and he, can, uh, he, he can make sure that um, you get to the right spot to donate, or if you want to volunteer, um, he can make sure uh, he gets that over to the volunteer coordinator. And what are some of the areas that people can volunteer? Because I think that's one of the issues that uh, someone like myself, I always want to try and volunteer, but... I have a special set of skills, and I'm not trying to use Liam Neeson's Taken. I have a special set of still skills, and I know how to use them. But if I have a special set of skills, will you 
put a volunteer position available? For, uh, would you make a volunteer position around the skills or will you help the volunteers who come in and sort of train them? And I'm, this might be a question that Bob might be able to answer, but as the chair, you right. should be able to answer as well. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's there's twofold. If, if we have somebody that comes in with a special set of skills that we may not necessarily have a spot for, but could enhance the organization, well, certainly we would carve out a position. Um, Oftentimes we'll post on um, Propellus, which is the old volunteer Calgary, um, and is a place where people can go to volunteer for a great number of things. So if we have a specific thing that we're looking for, but the, a couple of a couple of ideas that just pop to mind that are that are always in need is maintenance. If we had somebody that that would come in once a week and you know bang a nail and fix a, an eaves trough and do all those kinds of things, that's always a position that. Um, uh, that we need and 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 seems to be lacking. Um, not a, again, not as many people sort of in the center on a daily basis working with the kids just because of the restrictions. But when that starts to free up, um, absolutely, people. I mean, uh, you know, there there might be a situation where they say we want to know about broadcasting and how you go on YouTube and Spotify, and so I'd say, hey, let's get Chris Brown in and he can talk to you for an hour or so about how to how to be a youtuber or how to how to be a podcaster so people with with uh, with interesting skill sets that kids wouldn't necessarily get a chance to talk with we've had gold medalists come in we've had uh, you know professional athletes come in when the raptors were here i had um uh, Canada's first first round draft pick, Leo Routens, who's now a broadcaster with the Raptors, and he came in uh, at a lunchtime and and talked with the kids. Um, and one of my favorite quotes was from his coach. Um, uh, I wish it came to my head. Anyway, he coached the Canadian national team, and he used to say, "A um, uh, dream is just a dream until you write it down. Then it becomes a goal." And I thought that was a pretty good little quote for, for junior high age youth to remember. So so sometimes we have those types of volunteers that will come in in a one-off. Or um, one of our board members is, uh, is fairly knowledgeable on Dungeons & Dragons. So he came in and did a weekly Dungeons & Dragons session with them. Um, Please give me that email address yeah. so I can get them to that game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So those are those are some of the things as we crawl out of the pandemic and we're able to bring more people in that we're, we would hope that we could do again for sure. I have a former youth that's now working at the city of Calgary doing marketing that used to come to the center that uh, that I hope we can get in to talk to the to the youth as well, because he knows the space intimately. He knows the area and he knows what he went through and, and has been uh, so far a, a success in his young life. I want to talk about the future. We are, I'm going to go out on the ledge here and say, hopefully by the springtime, we will have some restrictions eased. We will be back to, I don't want to say normal because everyone doesn't believe what a normal is or everyone has a different opinion on what normal is. But I want to know what is in store for the Cornerstone Youth Center in the future. Let's start with one year, then go two years and then say five years because you always want to try to evolve. You always want to try bring new stuff to the organization as chair. What are you visioning and what are you and the board working on to make the uh, youth center grow and be better for years to come? So that way it's around and organ and kids of the area can access this great organization. Well, I, I, I'm going to give you a boring answer to start. Um, we've really been able to work and dig down in our governance and our, our committees and those types of things so that we're structurally as a, as an organization set up a lot better than we were pre pandemic. A lot of, um, a lot of professionals when they come in and do a, you know, they'll come in and uh, consult an organization and they'll look at, at what ails it and so on and so forth. The phrase, how much time are you spending working on your organization versus how much time you're willing to spend 
working in your organization is is a is a big question that comes up and so because of the pandemic because we haven't had as much going on in the center we've had more time to work on the organization and then as we come out of the pandemic of course we're going to be probably spending more time working in the organization and i'll get to stop by and say hi to the kids and all that sort of stuff um I, I think I think it's still going to be, and if Bob were here, he'd probably back me up on this, because I, I basically what I know is what we hear from from our staff. And I, I think we're going to still have all these same issues that we're working on now in terms of isolation, in terms of um, uh, self-esteem that got worse during the pandemic, that we're still going to be working with less kids doing more. But as we go out one and two and three years, I think we probably will end up back with, you know, sometimes 50 kids a day coming into the center. Is that typical? 50 kids? That early days, we've had between 30 and 50 on average. Um, Now, that's not all at one time, right? So we we opened from 3.30 to 7 o'clock. So from 3.30 to 4.30, you might have a group of 20, 25, and then et cetera, et cetera, right? It, it evolves and flows. Um, so literally now, they book times. So if you come in from 3.30 to 4.30, then we've got somebody else coming in at 4.30. Um, again, because those restrictions are so, so tight at the moment. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15-second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. That was a great commercial, eh, guys? (laughs) Um, I, Larry, I, I, I want to ask this question because it is a delicate question and I want to uh, ask it correctly. Youth safety is one of the biggest concerns of a parent today, particularly in that age range that you were talking about that use the organization, the Cornerstone Youth Center. How do you as chair ensure that a parent is sending their kid to a space that is safe, that is reliable, and that their kid will learn something that isn't going to negatively affect them in their life. So different levels of that question. So of course there's all the tick boxes. We've had police checks, we've had vulnerable sector checks on all of our staff. We uh, we make sure they go through all of the proper courses including uh, Little Warriors course, which is a fantastic course if anybody out there uh, is is working with youth. Um, The Little Warriors course is amazing. Some of the things we learn from courses like that are there's no room with a door that doesn't have a window in it. You can always be seen by somebody. There's no private meetings. If a staff is going to have a private meeting with a student, they will bring another staff in. So all of these policies and procedures are in place to ensure that safety, to ensure that there's always somebody around looking, following up, seeing what's happening in the center. There's cameras all over. We can go back and review cameras. If we've had situations, which we've had, you know, if somebody comes to the door that it's not one of the youth and is trying to get in and stuff. We can go back and look at cameras. Um, those and we have outside as well as inside cameras. Those cameras can is often used by the police for different things if something happens outside of our center. In fact, there was a traffic accident <laughs> and our cameras <laughs> caught it, and the police used that. So, um, yeah, we we do everything humanly possible right we we make sure we our checks and balances are on all of our staff all of our volunteers um and the cameras and as well windows in every room that has a door and the staff have that policy of uh, you never do private meetings with any students there's always always groups of people around i want to follow up with that on that's great about that side of it but 
I was a teenager once. <laughs> I know conflict is a massive thing about teenagers, especially with parents or even uh, uh, teenager to teenager conflict. How does your organization handle potential conflicts with internal kids who are using the organization? Do you do you have mediation? How they just want to make sure that when if a kid goes there and a parent who's watching this goes, okay, Larry has said X, Y, and Z, and I feel safe sending my kid because if there's an incident, they will resolve it in a time fashion but also in an appropriate manner yeah again there's policies in place and policies and procedures in place but it also gets to the point where some kids just need to be banned and they have been and there's also situations where those banned kids have been given an opportunity to come back and these are the these are the tick boxes that you have to come up with as a uh, youth in order to come back whether it's apologies whether it's you know a, a, a whole list of different things so again this is all in policy and procedure so all of the staff are going to follow those procedures um, first it's find out what the situation is find out who's causing the trouble um, work with both of the youth and then it it can escalate into one or both of the youth saying sorry you're you're affecting our group Right. It's, it's about the safety of the group. So you want to you want to err on the side of helping that individual youth. But if that turns into impacting the rest of the youth, then we've got to we've got to make a separation. I, I thank you for answering those. Um, yeah. and, uh, and I'll say the things the staff knows. Before you go, can you, continue, can you start that back? I hit the wrong button. Okay. So, can you just... so one of the things I also wanted to mention around that too is the, the staff is very well aware that, uh, that they're not going to be able to always connect with every youth. And sometimes, you know, the, the, the problems are bigger than what we can handle. And that that's just life. Right? <laughs> Before we close out here, I have one last question for you, because we've covered a lot in the last 40 minutes, but there's always that one question that, as a chair, you're like, why did you ask that question? Because I've, I've been told that a few times in the last few weeks, that there's always that one question I should have asked, so I'm going to put it on the record and say I'm asking it right here, right now, you're hearing it here first. What about the organization have we not covered that you want the people who are listening to this in Calgary, across Canada, even around the world, because for some reason we have a strange following in Australia and Germany. Donka Shane and hello down under. What would you want them to know about the Cornerstone Youth Center? I think going back to the whole pivoting thing um, ha has brought up a lot of interesting learning. So I, I would say that before the pandemic, we were we were looking at how we might be able to scale and grow the organization and do more than one center. And having to then go back and hunker down and, and be individualistic, I think we've also looked at the power of being uh, the power of being good to a fewer number of kids is a, being great, actually, to a fewer number of kids rather than being, you know, OK with a with a larger number of kids. Maybe the maybe the focus, um, you know, going forward. And I think it's the pandemic that really opened our eyes to that. And it may not have happened without the pandemic. So um, so that's that's an interesting learning, I think. And one of the things um that that all take away from it is uh, is that it really helped us learn that for those who are listening and those who are watching uh larry how can people reach out don't of uh, donate potentially volunteer potentially look at sending their children or getting their children registered for an upcoming program or a class <laughs> Well, first off, cyccalgary.com is the website where you'll see lots of information about where we are, the address, um, et cetera, photos, who the staff are, who the board is. Um, Sorry, I'm not going to, I'm just going to interrupt because you said the uh, uh, website address. And I was like, have I been looking at the wrong website this entire time? Because I have, I have cornerstone youth center.com yes. cornerstone youth center.com. I am. I apologize. Yeah. CYC Calgary is our inner, our email. We still have that. Our email was our old website. So yes, cornerstone youth center.com. 
has has all of our, our wonderful information on there. And then if you wanted to donate, volunteer, bob at cyccalgary.com. Uh, and... Um, if you uh, if you wanted to just see what was going on social media wise, we're on Facebook and Twitter, and uh, and you can catch up with uh, sort of the latest in those places as well. Thanks for the correction. <laughs> Awesome. Um, for anyone who's listened to the show before or watched the show before, you know what I'm about to say. The links to the Cornerstone Youth Center, the uh, website, the email address for Bob McInnes, the uh, uh, executive director, executive director will be in the show notes. So if you're on YouTube, literally scroll down because it's literally right there. And if you're on uh, any, if you're listening to this by Spotify, Apple podcast, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts, Go back a page and the notes are right there. Um, Larry, I want to thank you for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure. And I'm always happy to have a guest like yourself come in and talk about a great organization. So thank you for being yet again another community spotlight here on the Cross Border Interviews. Thanks, Chris. Cheers. Cheers.